This is pretty cool. I was wondering why all this was fenced in. There's bald eagles in there. This is probably where they have a show. Bald eagles. The reason Mikey doesn't know he's a Garrett's hawk is because he was raised by a pair of golden eagles. Mikey's hands attitude. Now the Garrett's bird and the peregrine falcon is one of the most widespread birds of prey in the world. They're found on every continent with the exception of Antarctica. These birds are built for speed. They have long, narrow, pointed wings, long tails, and even nostrils specially designed to allow them to breathe at 160 miles per hour. They are designed to match every clean twist and turn of their prey, which consists largely of different types of birds. Their hands. Recommend that you get a blanket or a towel, maybe a glove of some type. Wrap the bird up and take it to your nearest pet. When Gimbal came to us a few years ago, he was already a full grown adult bird, so this is as big as he's going to ever get. And we don't know how old he is. But we know in the wild, screech owls really can only live to be 7 to 10 years of age. But in captivity, they can live all the way up to 20 years of age because of good food, veterinary care, and little stress. In the wild, screech owls and most owls do not build their own nest. So if you're a person, maybe trying to attract one of Mother Nature's best pest control experts to your own backyard or to your own property, you can build a nest box. Your nest box is going to look very similar to the one that we have off to the side of the stage. We do have nest box plans available on the side of the stage, so pick those up at the end of the show. Gimbley, he is our smallest bird you are going to see with us here this afternoon. Gimbley weighs in a very impressive. Five and a half ounces. As I said, Buzz is a black vulture, which is one of two different vulture species found around this area. With, of course, the other one being the turkey vulture, which has that bright red head. Now, Buzz, she's a good example of what we call a human imprinted bird. Or a bird that was taken from her nest at a very early age and hand raised by humans. Therefore, Buzz doesn't see herself as a black vulture. Instead, she sees herself as a person. Now, as you listen close, as Buzz takes off the back glove and takes off of my glove, you might hear her make a little bit of a grunting sound. Listen closely, if you can get a chance to hear it. That was a good one. <laughs> Vultures actually lack a voice box. So the only sounds they're really capable of making are grunts and hisses. Now unfortunately, many people think that these birds are ugly, nasty, stupid, or even carry diseases. None of these things are true. They're very beautiful and graceful when you see them soaring high in the sky. And they don't carry diseases. Instead, they help prevent them from taking up our roadways. Church steeples, mines, caves, even hollow trees for their nest sites. And part of it is they really do like to live in these types of places and structures because they attract many of their favorite foods. Mice, voles, and shrews. The part of they eat a lot of mice. We thought about going to one and to the other, didn't we? You like that? They eat a lot of mice. In fact, a barn owl can eat, can eat over 2,500 mice in the course of just one year. Barn owls have many different adaptations that allow them to be such fearsome predators. <laughs> one of these is silent flight. As Jupiter continues to fly out over the audience, you are not going to hear a single bit of sound from his wings. Maybe a little bit from my microphone, but not any noise from his wings. Barn owls are completely silent flying birds. Their flight feathers have a rigid. Did you hear anything there? Their flight feathers have a As I said, the crested caracara is a relative of the falcon family. But as you can see, she looks nothing like any falcon you've probably ever seen. Instead, she looks more like she was made from the spare parts of a chicken, a vulture, and a hawk. All rolled into one. They're found in South Florida, Texas, Arizona, and they are the national bird of Mexico. You may hear them refer to as a Mexican. 
and chicken, the Mexican eagle, or the Mexican buzzard. Now with her long legs, my full hair style, Miss Monita has always loved to pose for pictures. In the wild, they would be turning over bark, rocks, and logs looking for their food. And she'd be looking for just about anything she could find. Grubs, slugs, lizards, amphibians, birds, dead or alive. Our 37 year old male golden eagle, Tecumseh. The golden eagle gets its name from the beautiful golden colored feathers found on the back of its head and the golden eagle is the most common eagle found on every continent in the northern hemisphere. In the United States, it is more a bird of the west, living in arid valleys and on lonely mountain tops, or from sea level up to 12,000 feet high. These birds are truly the masters of their environment. A strong and powerful flyer, they seem to be light and soaring through gale force winds, and have even been known to climb thermal updrafts up to four miles high with the capabilities of diving at speeds of about 200 miles per hour. Golden Eagles. Feathers from golden eagles have been given to warriors for their bravery. And the long, flowing headdress of an Indian chief represents a lifetime of valor. In Judeo-Christian beliefs, eagles have been symbolically mentioned many times in both the old Abraham, our four-and-a-half-year-old male bald eagle. Unfortunately, at the age of only six weeks, Abraham was knocked from his wild nest here in Sevier County during a thunderstorm, and he suffered a permanent injury to his left wing, so he is not releasable. Now you may wonder where the bald eagle gets its name. They certainly aren't bald, they have feathers on their head. Bald, in this sense, simply refers to an old English word that means white-headed. They get their white head and tail at about four to five years of age, and prior to this they are a brownish color all over, indicating their immaturity. This bird's other name is the American Eagle. It's been our nation's symbol since 1782. A resident of North America, they live by large lakes, rivers, and oceans where they can hunt for their favorite food, fish. They'll also eat waterfowl, various mammals, reptiles, and very often even carrion. They are one of the largest birds of prey that we have here in North America. Some Alaskan females can reach a wingspan of 8 feet, a length of 42 inches, and a weight of a very heavy 16 pounds. Their breeding life will also begin at four to five years of age, and at this point, a lifelong mate will be selected, only to remate if their faithful companion should die. The pair chooses a nest site, usually a large tree near water, and they return to this nest year after year, adding new materials until sometimes these nests can weigh a ton or more. Once the three eggs are usually laid, an incubation is done for both parents. The eggs hatch in 30 to 40 days, and the young grow rapidly. They reach adult size and are capable of making their first flights at only 12 weeks. Our non-releasable breeding pairs here at Dollywood help contribute to the wild population. And as of this year, we are proud to announce we have now released 159 bald eagles into the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains. effort to repopulate these beautiful birds in our area. Throughout the 20th century, their population declined. Fold it in half, hand it a primer tuck, he will take it in his beak and put it right into his donation box. Today's donations of $10 or more, you can get your choice of one of two things. First up, we have our American Eagle Foundation travel coffee mugs. It's starting to get cold, hot. And right after the show, you come out here and they have all these birds in cages for people to see. Pretty cool. Just got done watching the Eagle Show. Millions of America Eagle. These are America's showbirds. So pretty here though. Girls are in looking at gems. That's 
Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Oh, touch it. Throw the secret potion in there. <laughs> so, in order to get this paint to float, of course, we alter it, we make it wetter, we adjust the wettability of it. That's enough. disappointed in how the blue did, but if, if I wanted the blue to do what I wanted it to do, I would have had to put a lot of liver bile in there and then it would have changed the blue for the rest of the day drastically. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe it was worth it. I'm not sure. Maybe it would have been. <laughs> 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 paper hanger. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's really nice. <laughs> so I shook it as I laid it in, and that caused that diagonal distortion. <laughs> I figured I had to kind of make up for what I didn't get. <laughs> that is neat. And it looks better up close, actually. I'll get it up to you in a moment. <laughs> Look at that. I will pick that up. Right out of here. Putting it in there. Yes, it does. Yeah. What do you call that blue? Prussian blue. Prussian blue. Prussian blue. Wow. Beautiful. It was first invented in uh, Berlin, 1704. Wow. These are crazy how that goes. I like those lines in it. Yeah, I like the lines too. That's called Spanishing when you shake it. That was first done in the late 1700s. But it took the English in about 1820 to define it a little bit. So how did you learn how to do this? Well, I was introduced to marbling through Curtis Finley in St. Louis in 1994. And so Curtis got me going on it. And uh, I just kept doing it and made, making lots of mistakes and learning. And I'm doing it still. It's like 24 years, I think. <laughs> So this young fellow in C3, he, he was one of the up and coming fire in the whole people. I'm going to count to three, you give it to me as loud as you can. You ready? One, two, three! Fire in the hole! There it is! Woo! Fire in the hole! Fire in the hole! Uh oh. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these people are around you, back and forth.
Stuck in a Tennessee tornado. My better judgment. for my happy wanderers. <laughs>